today the feast of St. Uh, Salter and Caius, popes of the early centuries. Mm-hmm. He'll be here in Massachusetts, I guess, in Framingham, near Boston. Mm-hmm. And we'll go ahead and read the epistle and gospel here uh, for this. Uh, so first of all, the epistle is taken from the first letter of St. Peter, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy hath re- regenerated us unto, unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead unto an inheritance of incorruptible and undefiled and that, and that cannot fade, reserved in heaven for you, who by the power of God are kept by faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you shall greatly rejoice, if now you must be for a little time made sorrowful in diverse temptations, that the trial of your faith, much more precious than gold, which is tried by the fire, may be found unto the praise and glory and honor at the appearing of Jesus Christ our Lord. And the gospel, you can stand for the gospel. Okay. Even according to St. John chapter 15. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, I am the vine, you the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him. The same beareth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If any one abide not in me, he shall not be he shall be cast forth as a branch, and shall wither. And they shall gather him up, and cast him into the fire, and he burneth. If you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. In this is my Father glorified that you bring forth very much fruit, and become my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. As I also kept my Father's commandments, and do abide in his love. These things have I spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be filled. Thus for the words of today's Holy Gospel. Peace be with you. Okay. The Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. For us, <clears throat> this is the beginning of a new time for many of us. That now, for us in America and in the New World and the Western World and the post-Vatican II world. We've been persecuted for being Catholics by a white persecution because we're cast out of the synagogues. As our Lord said, the day will come when they cast you out of the synagogues, thinking they do a service to God. But then there shall also be a persecution. And for us, this is new that now we're afraid, if you have mass, that maybe the cops will come and threaten you, and the neighbors will turn you in, and that you might get a fine, and you might be thrown in jail, and the priest, and now we're the first time in the history of America where the whole country is in a state in which maybe, maybe we'll be allowed, how long will we be allowed to say Mass? They've closed the churches, and the priests closed the churches, the bishops closed the churches, and the Pope closed the churches, and they closed them very happily, and the Holy Father said, we must obey the United Nations. That's what the Holy Father told us, Pope Francis, a little while ago. We must obey the United Nations. He is the man who is supposed to be, and who really is, the representative of God on earth. Now imagine that you are in heaven with all the hundreds of thousands of saints, and with the millions and actually millions and millions, billions of angels, standing before the throne of God, and you hear the successor of St. Peter, the successor of St. Peter and the successors of the apostles and the successors of those first priests and the successors of the disciples, the seven, the seven deacons, one would be the first martyr, St. Stephen, and the successors of the holy women and the successors of the, of the men that stood around the cross and the successors of little children, like one child who in about the year 200 A.D. stood up in front of the emperor and said, You must worship the true God, O emperor. And the emperor didn't want to hear what the two-year-old boy said, and so he killed him. And the two-year-old boy now resides in heaven. We are their descendants in the faith. What must be the reaction of heaven at us? What on earth must be their reaction 
We're like the horses at the Kentucky Derby. There's a Kentucky Derby. You put the horses inside of the of, of the um, those 14 different gates. It's locked on all sides. And then they open the gate. And they blow the whistle. And they look in. And all the horses already died of fright. They already died of exhaustion. The, the jockeys already fell off the horse and broke their necks. They didn't even come out of the gate. They didn't even start to trot. They didn't even get into the race. And the fans are in the sands saying, okay, where's the, where's the race? They called it off because of the virus. They were not six feet away from each other. And they called it off. And they all died of fright. It says in the book of Wisdom, chapter 17, of one type of a man, it's good to read Wisdom chapter 17. It speaks about the three days of darkness in Egypt. And the Holy Ghost tells us during those three days it became pitch black in Egypt and only in Egypt and there were no devils running around. There was no angel of death running around. There was no danger of any kind. It was just really dark. And what happened? A man was out in the field, and he fell in fright, and he could not go out from the field back to his house. Another man was in his house, and he was in terror, and he could not go out of his house. And they heard the rustling of the trees, and they thought they were demons. And they heard the wind blow, and they thought they were attacked by great armies. And what does the Holy Ghost say? And their fear was laughable. And some died of the fear. There wasn't one devil to kill them. There wasn't one angel. Those who survived the three days of darkness and were in the army of Pharaoh, they had something to fear, but they didn't fear that day. They were terrified during the three days of darkness when there was nothing to fear. And then they were not afraid with a wall of water on one side and a wall of water on the other side when there was a lot to fear. And they went straight into that, into that, into that uh, uh, Red Sea and they saw if those women and children can cross this sea, if that old Moses can cross this sea, if Joshua can cross this sea, we can cross this sea in our chariots. That's what they thought. It was a time to be afraid. But they were not afraid. And they went without fear into the midst of the sea. And these are the same fools who when they should not be afraid, they were afraid. They were afraid of nothings. And we know that there are many prophecies that the three days of darkness will return. But we don't know if it's going to be three physical days of darkness, like unto the days of the, uh, the Egyptian darkness. Because if you were a dog during the three days, walking around, you would have seen perfectly fine. Only the Egyptians could not see. They alone had the darkness, and they could not see. And the sun was shining bright, but they couldn't see. And the wind was normal, and the animals were normal, but they were in darkness, and there was nothing to be afraid of, and they were afraid. And some of them died of their fear. Now we are like the Egyptians. There's nothing to be afraid of, but we are afraid. What about our ancestors? Today we have two popes, St. Caius and Soter. I didn't have time to look up on their life. Two popes, I only, know two, I only know one thing about them. They died for Christ. They were bishops who were elected the Bishop of Rome. And everyone that was elected the Bishop of Rome from the time of St. Peter until Liberius in the 300s, every single one of them died a martyr. What was in the spirit of those ancestors and all the bishops and all the priests? They became bishops and priests and they joined the Holy Church. And if you were baptized, you had to sneak into the catacombs. And so many died because they love God. We have a beautiful Mexican psalm. I don't speak Mexican. A Mexican song about a, a Cristero who died 
in the revolution in the 1920s. And he said, I must go and meet my Lord and I must die because they found Jesus in my sombrero. He had a holy card hidden in his hat. And they didn't know that he was a Cristero and they said, and they grabbed his hat and sure enough, there was that holy card. And he was put to death because he had a picture of Jesus in his sombrero. And how happily did he die because of a picture of Jesus. And what about our ancestors in the early centuries? They had to go to death. And we are now at a time when we're surrounded by the, the police and we're surrounded by the global positioning satellites. I don't know where I'm located right now, but Google knows. And Siri knows. And Alexa knows. And Hillary knows. And Obama knows. And all the bad guys know. So that's enough knowledge for me. What are we supposed to know? Is there something more important to know than our global positioning triangulation spot on the earth? We were following an Indian over here and tried to take the scenic route through parking lots. The GPS guarded the guided us through parking lots and through uh, through uh, with a, a tennis court. Because after all, Google knows best. But God knows better than we do. God knows better even than Google knows better than Siri, knows better than Alexa, knows better than the well, wise men that rule this world. Knows so much better. What was in the heart of our ancestors? We are now in a time where the most sacred thing is my health, my life. I've got to stay alive. A few years ago, there was a, we had to help some people cross the street and some health officials told me, some, it was some EMS guys, they told me, said, you know what, Father, we learn in our tra EMS training, when we're training to become uh, emergency officials, that the first responsibility of the fire chief and the first responsibility of the EMS official is to make sure that his EMS employees are safe. His first responsibility is to make sure the firemen are safe. Because if you don't have a live fireman, he can't save somebody. If you want to be safe, stay in the firehouse. <laughs> if you want to be safe, don't join the army. If you want to be safe, don't go to war. And definitely don't drive. <laughs> because more people die on the roads than die of the virus, and die of the flu, and die of everything else. Don't drive. You've got to be safe. Stay in your house. That's the most important thing if you want to be safe. But supposing that that's not the most important thing. Supposing that it's better to love. There's something better than safety. Is love better than safety? All the stories you learn as children in the old days are stories about love. All great stories are about love of a man. A man that loved a girl. A love of a beautiful young maid. And what happened? There was an obstacle between him and the beautiful young maid. Between him and the princess. There were monsters in the way. There were armies in the way. There were oceans in the way. There were storms in the way. There was every conceivable and inconceivable obstacle in the way. There was the devil in the way. But love is not blocked by any of those things. Love goes after the bride. Love goes after the source and the object of the love. That's what love does. And why is it that we are so afraid? The deep reason why we are so afraid in the world today is because we don't love. And we don't know what love is. In fact, we do love. We just love ourselves. And we love our own health. And we love to protect ourselves. And we love to be safe. So make sure you're safe. I want you to make sure that we're safe. I brought a safety piece of equipment with me. Very important to always have this because you have to be six feet. See? Very, very important. You gotta be safe. Is this gonna keep you safe? The fact is there must be something more than a measuring tape to keep you safe. Maybe you need something else. Maybe we need the Holy Rosary. Amen. 
Maybe we need the scapular. Amen. But what we really need is love. And love is missing in the world today 100%. Consider St. Peter and St. John. St. John is a beloved apostle. But let's remember the circumstances of St. John when he wrote his gospel. And the circumstances of St. John when he wrote his, his epistles. And the, the circumstances of St. John as he lived during those first hundred years of our church. What were the circumstances? He was surrounded by a Roman world that hated him. He was surrounded by kings and magistrates that wanted to put him to death. He was surrounded by enemies who wanted his death and wanted the death of all of his sheep and wanted the death of his entire religion. And what was in his heart and mind? What is in the heart and mind of someone that goes to war? The man on the battlefield is shot and he's wounded and he is about to die. What does a man do? He pulls out a picture of his wife. That's what he does. And what if he has a deep love? What if he has a great love? Then he pulls out a crucifix. That's the love of loves. He kisses his scapular. That's the love of loves. The great tragedy of the world today is that there is not any love in modern man. And therefore, he is a wimp. Love makes us do things. Love makes us move. And love, especially the love that a man should have, love must be exciting. Who wants to hear the story? Prince Charming fell in love with a beautiful girl. They had a nice wedding. Everybody came. It was nice. They got together. It was beautiful. They never fought once during the course of their 75 years of marriage. They had a perfectly healthy death. They have taken their medication at the right time. Have a proper 2,000 calorie diet. With everything being beautiful, they fell asleep and died on the same day. Isn't that wonderful? For faggots, maybe. For men, no. What is a wonderful story? One of a story is a story that has obstacles in it. A story by which love is shown to be so great that it overcomes every obstacle. And who is our father? We call him the man of faith, but in fact, he was a man of unconquerable love. And his name is Abraham. And one day Abraham was told, remember I told you you're going to have more children than the stars in the sky? You only had one and you're 112 years old. I want you to take that one son that I gave to you, that 12-year-old boy Isaac. I want you to take him to the top of a mountain, and I want him to be slain. And I want you to give him back to me in sacrifice and kill your only begotten son. And what did Abraham do? He did not complain. He did not protest. He didn't argue. He argued to save Lot. He argued to save the horrible city of Sodom. He argued to save Gomorrah. But he would not argue to save his own son. Because he was asked to make a sacrifice. And he happened to love the God that asked him to make the sacrifice more than he loved Isaac. He happened to love that God more than he loved Sarah. He happened to love that God more than he loved life. And his love made him stand up and carry Isaac. And he taught Isaac so very well, though he was such a young boy. And what did Isaac do? The Jewish historians tell us of the ancient tradition. What did Isaac do when they arrived at the place? Isaac, first of all, the scripture tells us, said, Where is the lamb? And Abraham said, God will provide a lamb for the sacrifice. They went to the top of the mountain, and then he said, Isaac, you are the lamb. You are the one that I must put upon the altar and tie. And Isaac said, if God wants me to be the lamb, let me be the lamb. You don't need to tie me to the altar. You don't need to tie me down. I lay there of my own accord. God gave me to you. And let God take me back. Where is the love? It's one of the miracles of the Holy Eucharist. So many miracles. <clears throat> What's the power of this Holy Eucharist? You know, there was a priest who had to go in the wilderness, in, either in, in Norway or in the Northlands. There was a man dying, and there was many, many wolves in the woods. And he had to go to bring Holy Communion and the confession and anointing to a man that was dying in the wilderness. 
So he took three horses with him because he knew that there were many wolves. And a boy came to serve his little mass, not the mass, just to serve the anointing and bring the Holy Communion. And they went off. And sure enough, the wolves came. And the priest released the first horse. And the wolves came and killed and ate the first horse. And he went on. Sure enough, more wolves came. So he released the second horse. And the wolves came and ate the second horse. And he was, went on, and sure enough, a third pack of wolves came. He was about to release the third horse. And the boy said, That man needs you. Goodbye, Father. Tell my mother I love her. And he jumped off of the wagon and he ran into the wolves. And they ate him. And the priest made it to the man and gave him Jesus Christ. The boy did not hesitate a moment because he knew that Jesus Christ, that the holy oil of the anointing, that the holy faith was far more valuable than his little life. And with great joy, he jumped off of that carriage, off that wagon, and he ran into the wolves. And now he is with God. His life was most wonderful. And Isaac did that. And Isaac was very happy to die at the age of 12. But what happened? God held back the hand of Abraham. But what's in the heart of Isaac? What's in the heart of Abraham? It is supposed to be in our hearts. Imagine being ordained a bishop and being ordained a priest in the first 300 years of our church. What does it mean to be the bishop of Rome? It means to die for the sheep. What does it mean to be the bishop of any other place? It means to die for the love of the sheep. What does it mean to be a priest? It means to die for the love of the sheep. What does it mean to carry Jesus Christ to prisoners like Tarsisius did? It means to die for the love of the sheep. And how Tarsisius gladly died rather than let go of that host that it might be desecrated that he was going to carry to prisoners. And how the fathers died, and gladly. And the same Lawrence, remember St. Lawrence who told jokes when he was on the gridiron? That's what he died like. But that same Lawrence, four days earlier, was weeping. Lawrence was serving the Mass of St. Sixtus, the Holy Father, the Pope. And the Roman soldiers came and captured Sixtus in the catacomb, and they brought him to be martyred, and they left Lawrence behind. And Lawrence said, let me go and die with you. I am the deacon. I serve you at the altar. Will you not let me go and die with you? How can you let me go without you? And Lawrence wept. And Sixtus said, Lawrence, don't worry. I am an old man, and I go to die today. But you are young, and you will die after me, and your glory is greater than mine. Don't worry. You'll die. Don't worry. You will receive a crown, but your crown is greater than mine. Here is Sixtus the Pope, Saint Sixtus, speaking to a young deacon and saying, I am going to my glory today, and I'll get a little crown in heaven. But you're going to your glory in a few days, and you're going to get a bigger crown than mine. You're going to be, have a greater love than me. And you're going to be a higher in heaven than me. And right now you serve at the altar in which I serve, Master. When you come to heaven, I will serve you. Don't worry, Lawrence. And Lawrence wept because he couldn't be martyred that day. But sure enough, they came after him and he received his great martyrdom. What is our trouble in our present situation? We don't love. Love doesn't motivate us. And love should create us in us joy. Love should create happiness inside of our hearts. How do we run to battle? With eagerness. We take the sword and we run to battle. Because why? We are running to our love. Let there be no obstacles. Therefore, if they come to us and say, I'm sorry, but your mass is illegal. All right. Arrest me and kill me. I'm sorry, but you can't worship your God. Fine. My God is God. 
He's not my God only. He is the God of everyone. He is a God that will judge us all. He is your God, and He is my God, and He is the God of all. And He is the God that judges. He is the God that preserves. He is the God that loves. And He is the God of all gods, and all other gods are devils. And they will go to the magistrates. What must we do? Why can't we love? We were given this holy faith. Why isn't it in our blood? We receive the Holy Communion. Why isn't it entered inside of us? We say we need daily communion. We say we need daily mass. But we have to be safe. Well, your daily communion, daily mass, didn't help you so far? Is it going to help you tomorrow? One Holy Communion is enough to hold you for a lifetime if it is had with love and with faith. We don't need to have Holy Communion every day. We don't need confession every day. But we always need faith and we always need charity, the divine love inside of our hearts. This we always need. And the trouble we have is that we're worried about all the wrong things. When we can see the beautiful words of our ancestors, St. John the Apostle, Deus caritas es, God is charity. They we're going around to do good, finding ways to do good. Remember the world they were in? Father, what's the report today? Well, the report is today you were going to have 100 people in the catacombs at Mass. 50 are missing. Where are they? Uh, they're being eaten by lions right now. Okay. Thank God. Go find me another 50. Go to the go to the go to the to the Colosseum and see if you can convert some of those souls that are attending that celebration and watch the 50 be eaten by the lions. Because the blood of martyrs is the seed of Christians. The blood of martyrs is our we are, we say Deo gratias. Every time we hear about the death of the martyrs, Deo gratias, thanks be to God. There's no more beautiful way to die than to die because of Christ. Babies die all the time, but babies are not remembered. But there were about 500 babies who on that day, 2,020 years ago, were killed because they were after one baby. And they didn't get him. Now you go and speak of those holy innocents. Don't you realize you could live a full life? There's hundred bazillions of years of eternity. You could have lived uh, 50 years, 100 years. You could have like bought a villa that's now decayed. You could have had a wife. You could have had a few kids. You could have had another meaningless, worthless, empty, useless life for a few years, followed by death and forgetfulness, but now you died. You were a block. You died that the child who was the king of kings might live. Do you think those kids want a longer life? Those boys, between the age of two and zero, those boys died in glory. And their mothers wept for a short time. <coughs> but what about now? My boy was one of the boys who died that Christ might go into Egypt. Joseph went into Egypt. When he went into Egypt, it was a rough day too. When Joseph went into Egypt, they were going to kill him. And when Joseph went into Egypt, he was brought in slavery. And when Joseph arrived in Egypt, he was there and he saved the entire world. And so now Jesus Christ is going to have a few tears on his way to Egypt, just like Joseph did. And just like when Joseph went to Egypt, blessings came to the whole world. So likewise, when this child goes to Egypt, blessings will come to the whole world. And these boys that died, they are holy innocents and saints. And they are happy. The faith should bring joy into my heart. And here are the words of St. Paul. We're talking about this. Our Lord Jesus Christ, rather. In John chapter 15. We read this when we're on the day of the death of a Pope. A martyr. Especially during this Paschal time. 
I am the vine and you are the branches. Christ is saying these words a few hours before he dies. And what does he talk about a few hours before he sheds his blood, the blood of the bloody sweat? Right there in front of him is Judas. And Judas is going to be ordained a priest sacrilegiously, going to receive Holy Communion sacrilegiously. And there are those other 11 men. Imagine on the day of our, your death, you had the vision and you knew that your 12 buddies, one of them's a traitor and the other 11 are cowards, and they're all going to run away. And one of them is your closest friend, going to deny you three times. It's time to give a sermon, isn't it? You need to be good. I told you you're worthless. I told you you're bad. It's time to give the sermon of Moses. Read Moses' sermon one day in Deuteronomy chapter 32. The last words of Moses to the Jewish people. What does he say? You are thick-necked. So you're following God today, but as soon as I die, you're going to dump them. That's what Moses said in his last sermon. But the same Moses said, don't worry. After you dump God and he punishes you and chastises you, have a few tears. Remember that your sinner isn't turned back to God and he will forgive you. Same Moses. Our Lord Jesus Christ, what does he say in his last speech before he dies? If you abide in me, and my word abide in you, you shall ask whatever you will, and it shall be done unto you. They asked so much that night. They asked with all their hearts, Lord, please don't let him die. Don't let Caiaphas get him. Don't let the soldiers get him. Don't let him die upon the cross. They so wanted that. And yet what happened? He died anyway. And when he died at 3 p.m., great horror of sorrows, it was the greatest of all sorrows, entered their hearts. And what does the Lord speak to them before those great sorrows enter their hearts? In this is my Father glorified that you bring forth very much fruit and become my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, I also have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you shall abide in my love. As I also kept my Father's commandments and do abide in his love, these things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and your joy may be filled. He's saying these words, only a couple hours before they shall be filled with the greatest of sorrows. Mm. Mm. Abide in my love. Mm. And St. John will tell us, the same beloved St. John, as he goes off to that death, he says, this is the night, this holy Thursday night, good Friday morning, good Friday afternoon. What happened during these 18 hours? It was a night in which he loved his own, and he loved them unto the end. There is no greater way to love. We must love unto the end. And our Lord Jesus Christ loved his disciples and he loved his apostles. He wanted to have three hours of peace with them. Judas had different plans. Judas had already planned that he be captured before this supper. But our Lord simply went to a different place, and Judas wasn't ready. But he went to a different place, and he didn't suffer like he was supposed to. Because he wanted these three hours to speak to his apostles about his divine love. And he wanted to pour that love into them, because he wanted joy in their hearts. A real joy. A joy that's not taken away by little things like police officers with guns. <laughs> A little thing like a, a iron that is lit on fire and it were roasted on, like Lawrence. A little thing like an army that wants to destroy the kingdom of God. A little thing like being monitored by the GPS. A little thing like the Bilderbergers. A little thing like the one world government run by all the bad guys. A little thing like a little bad thing not worth thinking too much about, like Hillary Rodham Clinton. <laughs> No, there's something more valuable than that, and that's love. I want to give you that true divine love which only comes from the Holy Roman Catholic faith. 
It doesn't come from Protestantism. They know not that which love is. They know nothing about it. It doesn't come from Vatican II. It doesn't come from the New Mass. It's not found there. Love is found in the true holy sacrifice of the Mass, the crucifixion of Calvary. Love is found in the true faith. And love is supposed to be transferred to us. Why can't we carry love inside of ourselves? Why can't we walk in the divine love? It means we must have the true faith inside of us, the true belief of God inside of us, and we carry that love to the very ends of the earth. And our Lord Jesus Christ says these words, I am going to give you joy. And he ran to the cross. He ran to the cross. Because he knew by this death, by this shedding of blood, by this great agony, he would attract our malicious weak and foolish and perverse hearts how do you attract a weak malicious and foolish and perverse heart it takes a lot of blood it takes a lot of scourges it takes crown of thorns it takes a lot of mockery it takes nails it takes a cross it takes a spear when all these things come, what happens? After all this great agony, what happens? The divine love goes forth and the water flows forth out of his heart. That water that's hidden inside. And to whom the water comes, these are saved. And right now is a time of water. We read about it during this Paschal Tide. Vidi aquam. I saw water going out from the side of Christ. And those to whom the water came... They were saved. Alleluia. That water goes to so many places. It goes to one and not to another. It goes to those that want to receive that love. We know that the only answer against Vatican II equals the true faith. We can't accept modernism. We can't accept ecumenism. All the foolishness. We can't accept also the full of the great error of sedivicantism, which is that the Pope is not the he's so bad he's not the Pope. No, he's the Pope. Being so bad is not so <coughs> abnormal for a Catholic. In fact, the so bad people in the world, the worst people in the world, they are Catholics. Well, that's not such an unusual thing. We pray for the conversion of these wicked Catholics, including our wicked Pope and the wicked bishops, and the weak pope and the weak bishops, who are supposed to go out as shepherds. What does a shepherd do? He leaves behind the safe sheep to go to the one that is lost. He goes where the danger is. Where is this virus? I've been looking for it. Wherever the dead bodies are, wherever the danger is, wherever they need to be anointed, that's where the priest needs to go. We are here in order to bring Christ to those that are abandoned, to those that are separated from the world and separated from all their friends. But they need God. And the whole world needs God. And it needs a divine love. And why do we bring the divine love? Because we want souls to be filled with joy. And what is joy? You can't decide, I'm going to be joyful today. Today is a joyful day. Be happy. Got it, punk. It doesn't work. <laughs> Joy is something that happens that we cannot control. What is joy? It's an effect that comes to us naturally whenever we're in the ordered, peaceful presence of the one we love. That's joy. And so the soldier has all the blood. He's wounded and he is about to die. But there is his bride. There is his, the one that he loves right next to him and he has joy because he's in the presence of the one he loves. And St. Lawrence had such great joy when he was dying because he was in the presence of the one he loves. He was there with God in his heart, God in his soul, the Holy Mother, the Blessed Virgin Mary with him, and he was filled with great joy. And that joy no man has ever taken from him, and no man ever will. And so if I can only keep the divine love inside of myself, 
If only I can ask the Holy Mother to make sure that I never go outside of sanctifying grace. If I only make sure that my desire is to carry him and his holy faith to the ends of the earth, to all those that love him not. If only I can have that, then there is going to be great peace and happiness, and it will just simply be joy. Imagine how our Lord said those words to 11 of those 12 apostles. I want your joy to be filled. He wanted Judas' joy to be filled too, but Judas didn't want it. The other apostles did, and their joy is filled. But between the time he poured the joy into them and the time that it was filled, they had many tears. They had many fears. They made many mistakes. But their joy is filled. So likewise for us, we may have many tears and many fears that we shouldn't have and make many mistakes, but let the joy never be taken away from us. Let the joy always be there. And so let's ask the grace that the joy of the true faith be inside of us and then never be taken away. And then we become like great followers of the, of the holy popes, these popes that died for the faith with great joy, of the martyrs that died for our faith down the last 2,000 years, and they we not fear the wrong things like we so easily and so foolishly do. Closing up as you all, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost, amen.